There are over 45,000 of them in the United States. 11,000 are children. Though you might see them daily, they will never see you. Though you might call out to them, they will never hear you. This is the story of three children who have lived for four years in quiet darkness. They are loved. They are cared for. They are cherished and adored. They laugh. They live. They explore a world of shapes and textures a world of scents and tastes, a world of faith. This is their story, though they cannot tell it. Just north of Houston, in a town called Spring, Texas, there lives a family whose lives are somewhat removed from the ordinary. Where unique challenges, selfless compassion, and patience are simply part of the daily routine. Liz Hooker is a mother of four. This is one of her daughters, Zoe. Zoe doesn't know what day it is. She doesn't know what time it is. She doesn't know that she's being filmed. Zoe only knows that what is happening now is part of her routine. And she only knows that her mother is guiding her through it because of her mother's smell and the feel of her face. These are two of Liz's other children, Sophie and Emma. The three are triplets. All three are deaf blind. George is the girl's stepfather. Sarah is nine, the oldest of the four. I have four daughters. Um, Sarah's my dreamer. She's a visionary. She's my artist. She's a really sweet child. She's got the best heart. She's rather spiritual. Zoe is the oldest of the triplets, and she's a wild child. She's almost like a little boy in the fact that she just likes to be dirty. She likes to get into everything and rub food in her hair and just, you know, she's just kind of, I think she's going to be a mud wrestler. And Emma is my prissy little lady, and she doesn't like to be dirty or hot likes to sing all day and she's just prissy. Sophie is my scientist. She likes to take things apart and put things together and figure out what makes the world tick. I hardly remember life before the triplets, but it was pretty typical. Right after high school, I moved from my hometown to a fairly larger town, about 40 miles away. Uh, there was a college in the, in, in the neighboring town to that. And uh, that's where I met Liz. And I'll never forget, a friend of mine, invited me to a party over in the college town, and we went, and it was, one of these, it was one of these apartment parties where you see it in the movies, you got all these guys and girls hanging out against the walls, drinking beer, just chilling. And I walked in, and it was, it was, it was my friend, myself, and, and a girl that I, was, that I was, I guess, I don't know, sort of dating, it wasn't really hot and heavy, we were just seeing each other. And uh, I walk in and turn the corner, and I see this girl, and it just stopped me cold. It was in an apartment building. I didn't really know anyone there, and I walked in with a friend of mine, and I sat down on the couch, and there was another couch across the way, and this guy was, like, looking at me, and he wasn't my type. He was just real preppy, player-type guy, 
and um, I was just trying to avoid him. Her eyes were incredible. I just couldn't stop thinking about her. So the whole night, I was blowing this girl off that I was with. I'm sure she could tell. I mean, I had no interest whatsoever in her. And then all of a sudden, he's like, hey. And I'm like, what? And he said, I'm not with her. Talking about the blonde to his right that he had his arm around. So I was pretty much sure that he was a player at that point and didn't want to have anything to do with him. And it got to the end of the night, and finally I just sucked it up, turned the corner, and, and walked over to her and said, hey, listen. I'm not even with this girl, and that was all I could get. And she looks at me and says, so? So I left the party, and I, w I, I mean, I wasn't interested in him, but I did think it was interesting how aggressive he was, you know? So I guess I was a little attracted to how cocky he was. But I felt like it was a huge victory because I managed to talk to her. So, so I go home, and then the next day, I'm still thinking about her, and I can't get her out of my head. And I don't know, a couple of days later, he ended up at my house, and he asked me if I would go on a date with him that weekend, and he brought me some flowers. So Liz and I began dating. We dated for about two years, and it was tumultuous. Incredible highs, incredible lows. It's crazy. I mean, you know, I'm 21. She's 19. Neither one of us knew what we wanted out of life. There was a lot of stuff going on in my home life, and I had finished two years of college and I wasn't going to be able to pay for going to university on my own. She walked in the door to the front desk and, and she said, hey, you know, I've had it. George was closing the tanning salon, so I walked up to him and he's like, hey, you came to see me? Because I lived um, about 10 miles away from him and I didn't have a car. And I'm like, no, I came to say goodbye. I'm gone. And I go, fine, go. She said, no, I'm really gone. I'm joining the Marines. <laughs> Because this is the kind of thing you got to understand. Liz would say, I'm going skydiving, I'm going to go drag racing, whatever. This is Liz. So she tells me she's going to the Marine Corps. You know, I'm like, okay, whatever. Uh, that's fine. 20 minutes later, she's on a bus. She's gone. And so I just joined the Marine Corps and left them. I carried this girl around in my heart. As, as messed up as I was, as ignorant as I'd been, I carried her around in my heart. And she was writing letters back and forth to me and letting her know that she had found somebody else. And that was the end of that. On April 30th, 2000, Sophie, Emma, and Zoe were born at Texas Women's Hospital. They were born premature at 24 weeks into the pregnancy. I had some prep time because I went into labor when they were 23 weeks at home at 7 o'clock in the morning, and I was um, sent to the hospital, and so I was in labor seven days before I delivered them, um, trying not to have them. The first child I held was Zoe, and it was when she was two months old. So, yeah, it's really hard because you're, you're so afraid you're going to hurt them or break them somehow. But um, I delivered them. I was awake. They did an epidural, and I had a C-section. And there were so many doctors in the room because each baby had to have a pediatrician, a NICU doctor, all these different things. But I remember they were wheeling them by, one by one, in their incubators. and. Um, they, they sent me back to the room to recover, and for two days, I just couldn't talk. I couldn't, I was just in shock, and I felt like I failed them by having them early, like maybe there's something I could have done. The girls are blind from a condition called retinopathy of prematurity, and I didn't find out that they were blind till about the fourth month, and I didn't find out they were deaf till they were two years old. And the girls are deaf from ototoxicity, which is poison to the ear, and it's caused by the combination of two strong antibiotics. When Claire was born, it, life is overwhelming. Claire was born with CHARGE syndrome, which is an acronym for six different birth defects. You have to have four out of the six to be labeled. Um, life was very overwhelming. We had three normal children, whatever normal means anymore, because you have to redi redefine the definition of normal and um, Claire was born deaf-blind. When Christian was born, he was uh, three months premature. That was 1980. And he spent two years at Texas Children's Hospital. Um, he had lung problems. He had retinopathy of prematurity. And from a good guess, I think he became deaf because of antibiotic toxicity, but I cannot be positive of that. I knew what it meant to have a preemie baby. In fact, when I uh, basically ruptured my membranes, 
um, I went almost into shock. They couldn't get veins on me. I, I knew what it meant to have a preemie, and I did, had not wanted a preemie. That was one of, the, um, one of the things of American medicine that I actually didn't believe in, <laughs> saving these little micro preemies. Um, as it turns out, I'm happy she got saved and, and she did good. Um, she, she was tiny. She was attached. When we saw her, she was attached to a million different uh, tubes. My two brothers were born deaf. Um, I, my oldest brother was born deaf. He's 24. And um, my twin brother was born deaf also. And he was also born with um, spinal meningitis. And so he's paralyzed from the waist down. And um, my oldest brother was diagnosed with blindness uh, when he was 11 years old. And that's what made my parents get my other brother checked. And so they're both diagnosed with deaf, deaf blindness. And um, their sight is deteriorating. They're not completely blind, but they see spots and tunnel vision. Their peripheral vision is completely gone. Uh, it was kind of hard. Uh... I didn't see him for the first day, five days of his life because he was life flighted to another hospital. So when I met the doctors and met my son for the first time, they told us that he would pretty much be a vegetable. They didn't mention deaf blindness, nothing of that nature. They just told us to consider his final moments on this earth and take it from there. Well, when he was five months old, he didn't progress as well as the other babies and we went to an ophthalmologist and they said well your baby's blind and walked out the door so it was kind of shocking at first deaf blindness is a condition of two parts and before you can examine the condition as a whole you need to understand both pieces there are over 45,000 legally blind children in the united states that's nearly enough to fill the Houston Astrodome. Blindness was first legally defined in 1934 by the American Medical Association and then modified in 1972. The United States Congress included this definition as part of the Aid to the Blind program, which states, an individual shall be considered to be blind for purposes of this title if he has central visual acuity of 2200 or less in the better eye with the use of a correcting lens. The legal definition also considers a field restriction. When you look straight ahead, you see 180 degrees. If you see less than 15% of that, you can also be considered legally blind. For a person with visual acuity 2200, an object three feet away is as hard to make out as an object 30 feet away for a person with 2020 vision. Deaf generally implies a profound loss of hearing. The word deaf, by federal definition, means a hearing loss which adversely affects educational performance. The term hard of hearing means a hearing loss, whether permanent or fluctuating, that adversely affects a child's educational performance, but which allows the child access to some degree of communication with or without amplification. People with a moderate hearing loss of about 36 to 50 decibels generally describe themselves as partially deaf. The ordinary spoken voice is 50 decibels. The term deaf, with a capital D, refers to those individuals with hearing losses who identify themselves with the deaf culture. These individuals view themselves as a population united by a common heritage, a shared experience, a multi-generational history, and a language American Sign Language, or ASL. ASL stands for American Sign Language. And who uses it, or what community is it used in? People who are members of the deaf community, and that's a capital D deaf. That means people who are involved with the community use ASL as their primary language, and it is used in America and in Canada. And ASL is its own language. It has its own grammar, just like English, Russian, Japanese, or any other established language. Some people wonder, ASL has grammar? How do you know? But um, you, know, you can see my eyebrows go up for a yes-no question, and they actually behave differently for WH questions. 
um, has adverbs, adjectives. Um, for example, an adverb is shown on the face. Uh, let me give you an example. Uh, like here I am reading a book. Here I am, but I'm drowsily reading, getting sleepy while I'm reading. It shows on my face. Or adjective, it's a large house. So see the facial expression, different. Or a thin, small pen or pencil or a soda. Uh, how big it is, or the straw, maybe too big or small, diminutive like that. You can the see deaf blindness for children is defined by the IDEA as concomitant hearing and visual impairments, the combination of which creates such severe communication and other developmental and educational needs that they cannot be accommodated in special education programs solely for children with deafness or children with blindness. Deaf blindness cannot be seen simply as a combination of two disabilities. Station plus wagon does not equal station wagon. Deaf blindness is a disability to communication and access to information. The vast majority of human communication is based around sights and sounds. A number of different shared etiologies of deaf blindness has to do with other disabilities as well. So in the medical field or, or for medical uh, services, de kids with deaf blindness require an array of different services from an array of different professionals and are usually coordinated by, by parents or family. Medicine provides limited answers or solutions for the reversal or prevention of deaf blindness. Medical research and treatment funding comes from the federal government. There are no specific monies set aside for deaf blindness except for vaccinations and funding for proven research. There are a few programs that can assist with some of the medical cost. Each individual impairment is treated and researched, but the right treatment for a specific condition is difficult to obtain. As an audiologist, one of our responsibilities is to evaluate the hearing loss of a child. And of course, if a child is deaf or potentially deaf, that's, that's where we fall in, in doing that. Audiological assessments are used to gauge hearing loss. These use several elements. The American Speech Language Hearing Association breaks the assessment down into a few categories. In physical examination, audiologists will look at the outer ear, known as the pina. The tympatic membrane, or eardrum as you may know it, is examined for any perforation or infection. You can see a reflection of the light that we use to look into the ear. That's called the cone of light. These pitched hums are used in what is known as a pure tone audiometry. Results are recorded on a graph called an audiogram. The audiologist also determines speech perception thresholds. Say the word sail. Sail. Say the word yearn. Yearn. Or the faintest speech that can be heard half the time. The eighth cranial nerve is the only nerve that sends sound information to the brain. Cochlear implants have been the largest breakthrough in treatment to restore hearing loss. A cochlear implant basically is where the surgeon goes in, uh, drills a hole in the back of the head, runs a wire down into the inner part of the ear to directly stimulate the nerve of hearing. And there can be up to 23 different electrodes in a space of about three-fourths of an inch uh, to stimulate directly the nerve of hearing. The wire comes out and attaches to a magnet on the back of the head, and then you have a magnet inside the skull and one outside the skull on, on the other side of the skin going into a processor. And the processor takes the sound in, converts that into electrical impulses, and sends that to the electrodes. To get any response when they first turn on the cochlear implant is a good sign. Um, but they don't always get a response. But all three of my girls gave a response. Sophie started crying, and she was looking for the source of the sound. Zoe just sit, sat there for a second, and then when she heard it, she just did the most beautiful smile, which was so awesome to see after months of her being frustrated. And Emma just kind of stilled like she was listening. It was really exciting. Balance assessments can detect several issues. Our sense of balance is determined by our visual system, the inner ear, and our sense of movement via muscles known as the kinesthetic sense. Part of the balance evaluation called video nystagmography where we're measuring the eye movement under different conditions. This is measuring the eye movements with an infrared camera. When these systems don't work together and function properly, we become dizzy. 
Any disturbance in the inner ear, with or without hearing loss or ringing in the ears, may cause a feeling of dizziness. Balance system assessment is conducted to detect pathology with the vestibular or balance system. To monitor changes in balance function or to determine the contribution of visual, vestibular, and proprioceptive systems to functional balance. Vestibular or balance system assessment is indicated when a person has rapid involuntary eye movement, complaints of vertigo, gait abnormalities, or when pathology or disease of the vestibular system is suspected. Visual problems can be determined by two types of specialists. Optometrists examine the eye and prescribe corrective lens solutions. They often catch certain problems and refer them to ophthalmologists. We as optometrists are trained to treat refractive errors, eye diseases from the standpoint of topical treatment and oral treatments, glaucoma. Um, we work with patients that have eye misalignment, patients with visual impairments. And the way we work together with the profession is of ophthalmology, who tends to be more on the surgical side or the medical management. For example, our patient today, Sophie, um, we would work with them. Initially, they would be seen by the ophthalmologist and taken care of by that particular individual because if they needed laser treatment of the retina due to the retinopathy of prematurity, they would take care of that portion of the treatment. Then as she's gotten older, just like we see with her today, she needs assistance to see smaller images better. So then we as the optometrist would work with her with magnification and magnifiers or in telescopes or closed circuit television systems. And we'd kind of co-manage her probably her whole life watching the aspects of the eye health and then the functional vision portion. We're all used to typical vision tests, particularly visual acuity. Acuity is clarity. Reading letters, numbers, and charts at varying distances to determine how well you can see at close and distant ranges. A refraction test is very similar, but with tests that determine proper corrective lenses. And people are always like, well, how can I get glasses on babies? Well, what we do is a total objective measure. We shine light in the eye, light bounces back out of the eye, and we hold lenses that are concave or convex to neutralize that light so parallel light comes out. And from that, we can actually make a measurement of a baby's spectral correction. There are also visual perceptual tests to determine cortical visual impairments, or CVI. This test is growing and kids with complex disabilities have difficulties processing the information neurologically. It tests the gateway for the way we digest visual information. Sophie doesn't need prosthetic eyes because she has eyes, and Zoe and Emma do have eyes, but they're small. Um, the prosthetic eyes are like a contact, but they're thicker, and they're molded to the eye almost like when you go to the dentist and they do a mold of your teeth. It's very similar to that. And um, what they do is they press on the orbital bones so that the face will grow normally. And they also help for social reasons because, you know, sighted people want to talk to someone who looks like they're looking back to them. In fact, I can tell a huge difference when Emma has her eyes in to how people treat her. When children are born early, there's abnormal blood vessel growth that occurs because of oxygen issues. And it can start to grow, um, abnormal new blood vessels will grow in, into the peripheral part of the retina and start pulling the retina so that it'll actually even twist. Um, and it can detach and pull away from the back of the eye here, and they can end up with a lot of vision loss from that. Because technology has become so efficient, so far as reading machines and other advances that make learning information easier, there is now a large push to have blind children to read Braille, as there is a growing population of illiterate blind people. But for all the knowledge that we've gained, the best way to understand the issue for people that are deafblind is to hear their stories. You're thrown into a whole different world. It's very different. The medical, you live in a medical field, you have to learn what different names mean. You have to know, we go to seven different specialists. You have to um, live one day at a time, one moment at a time. CHARGE stands for six different birth defects, colobomas of the eyes, uh, heart defects, coanal atresia, uh, retarded growth, um, and uh, ear problems, either exterior ears or inner ear problems. It was, um, he needed the oxygen to survive, but it was also doing damage to his eyes. And so when he, he had uh, glaucoma and it progressively got worse. He had 
retinal detachment. Probably had eight to 10 eye surgeries. And when he came home, when he was two years old, he um, had two more eye surgeries, but progressively his eyes worsened, his hearing worsened to where he was considered totally blind and profoundly deaf. Edwin has a uh, Usher syndrome type two, which is uh, deaf blindness, uh, initially deaf, and then the blindness or loss of vision proceeds later as he gets older. Um, I think, I'm not sure what age he was diagnosed officially as Usher syndrome. We knew about the deafness when he was one years old. And then later on in life, we found about the Usher syndrome or the blindness that, that came with that. So um, he's totally different from Jeremy, who is Usher syndrome and spina bifida. Um, and, and at this, Jeremy's needs were totally different from Edwin's needs. Uh, both, even though both of them had Usher's, Jeremy having spina bifida presented a whole different set of problems to go along with that. As a parent back then, um, we really didn't know where to go. Now, there's a whole other host of side effects that go with it, like swallowing, breathing, um, difficulties with all the, the cranial nerves, so facial palsy, uh, taste, uh, smell are affected or can be affected, inner, inner ear problems like balance can be affected. Uh, so it's a whole host of issues that you gotta you gotta work through either through occupational therapy or through uh, you know different specialists. For the first 15 years of his life, they said he had Milos syndrome, which stands for mitochondrial encephalopathic lactic acidosis, stroke-like episode syndrome. Last year they said no, he doesn't have it, so we're starting all over again that he has a mitochondrial disorder that affects the muscles and the mitochondria. So he is very spastic, very tight. He's in a wheelchair. He can't control his arms and legs very well. She had a few laser, a few minor eye surgeries, nothing major. And then when she's about six months old, I remember thinking even actually that, you know, we're lucky her eyes are okay. Because I knew that's, that's one, th one of the things you worry about. At six months, she suddenly deteriorated. Uh, just for no reason at all, her eyes became very, very bad. They call it something, uh, they call it rush, rush disease. disease. Right. And just like that, her eyes went bad. And they really just couldn't uh, do anything about it. And she basically was pretty much lost her vision around that time or in the next few months after that. And, and just talking about that, I think uh, there were so many other issues of survival at that time that even the ophthalmologist however much they might have wanted to do, they were limited in what they could do because of her health concerns. And they also took a back seat because I don't think anyone honestly believed this child would survive. Because Claire was vent dependent, so anytime we brought Claire anywhere, we had to carry a car battery, a 30 pound vent, an oxygen tank, a suction pump, a food pump, plus all the extra equipment. So we um, made sure that we stayed in shape and we brought her everywhere and we broke several strollers. But, you know, our kids have grown and they are going to be great people. They are great people. Not many six-year-olds can knows how to suction a trach and change a trach out. And when, our, when something happens... Not that our, she ever has. <laughs> our six-year-old doesn't change the trach, but she does suction the trach, yes. Yeah. She helps all... We have nurses in and out of our house all the time. And my six-year-old thinks she's the little mama and shows knows how to do, truly she can do everything because mm -hmm. it's important when you have special need kids that the whole family is affected. It's been six years, and we found each other again. So I was in a terrible marriage, and <laughs> three-year-old, and I worked full-time and traveled all the time, and my daughter was in daycare. I grabbed a hold with both hands, and we were off and running, and we started to date. Um, she had just gotten a divorce. I started thinking maybe this guy 
could handle this. And again, we felt like high school kids. I mean, we had a blast. And in the course of first few weeks of dating, she says, I told him there was something huge that I wasn't telling him and I wanted to go out on one date. She tells me that she has triplets. I told him to think about it for, you know, a couple weeks and email me because there's a possibility that we could end up together. And she says, there's more to it than that. They're deaf and they're blind. I really didn't think it was going to go anywhere. In fact, I figured, I mean, I, every month I thought, okay, it's going to be over this month. I always knew that if I ever was able to get over myself and settle down, that she was the one. And that was what was going through my mind. And I started to think very seriously about marriage. And again, I think that completely threw her because she is again telling me, are you not paying attention? I love you, but I love you enough to let you go if you want to go. He's been a bachelor for 32 years, you know. So when he proposed to me, I was really surprised. Yeah, we had just joined about six months ago a really, really cool church. And it had all these hip cats in it and people were all about the presentation and the music and it was like this this big production and I went to our music leader and said hey listen I want to propose to Liz but I'd like to do it at church you know and he said well hey we're having this marriage series and at the end of it why don't we do that and I was like perfect the big ending His parents knew how he had felt about me before, and they seemed to be really into it. You know, they were excited for him. I called my parents and told them that this is what I wanted to do, that Liz was, had always been the one, was the one, and is going to be the one. But then when I found out Banky, or George, was going to get married, well, it went through my head. That was a pretty big load to take on. He'd been a bachelor for a good many years there, and, and uh, I just told him, I said, boy, you talk, you're just taking on too big a load. And I think I'd think about this. And then uh, he told his mom that he loved her more now at that time. And uh, he did back 12, 14 years ago. My story goes back further than that. When George dated her, this was his love from 14 years ago. She would come down to the house and we'd ride horses together. So we were kind of, you know, it was a friend deal at that time, you know, so I wasn't really shocked. And like I said, when he told us that day, he said, Mother, I love her more now than I did 14 years ago. I said, well, I guess you need to marry her. As soon as I say I do, I just got a built-in family right that second. I've got five other people in my life, and they're all girls. <laughs> you ready? <laughs> I now pronounce you husband and wife in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. George, you may kiss your wife. <laughs> Just one. Before we got married, you know, when I was envisioning our life together, I never thought that he was going to jump in and do everything with me. You know, I just figured it would be, you know, he would work, I would work, and the kids would solely be my responsibility because they're his stepkids, and then he was going to love and support me. So my job of taking care of the kids would be easier. I'd have somebody to fall back on. Because it was impossible for me to take all four kids out by myself because Zoe and Emma weren't walking. And having someone come alongside and help me go places with them was awesome. It was the first time I'd ever done anything like that as a family. People have just really, really surprised me with their insensitivity to the, to the situation. In, this, in, in our newly enlightened, politically correct society, I don't know if it's just a matter of people don't want to see the hunchback of Notre Dame out in public. I don't know. But it seems like that we're just made to feel exceptional and not necessarily in a good way. Before I take them anywhere in public, I have to make sure that I'm rested and that I'm in a pretty good mood because there's no way to show up incognito with these children. Um, as soon as I walk in somewhere, 
people are staring at us and people will pull their children away from my children as I'm walking through the mall. I've had um, a woman come up to me and ask me what I did to my children. You know, I've learned to have a lot of grace with people, but I still don't understand um, some of the things that, that happen to me now that this is a part of my life. I've, I've, I was really surprised that more people don't hold the door for us. People will kind of look at us and whisper to the others that they're with. I'll tell you what really pisses me off is when people make us to feel like we're a burden. Like we're causing this problem that it's our fault. This is our fault that we have these three kids. Why don't we stay home? You know, yeah, you got to go to the grocery store. Find a way to do it without your kids because we're all in a hurry. So I'm standing in line and I've got one kid climbing out of the cart. And I've got another one that's crying and she's beating herself because she wants something to eat and drink and can't tell me. And then I have a third one that wants to wander off. So here I am trying to wrangle all this stuff. Instead of people saying, you know, what can I do to help you? What I get is a look that makes me feel like I'm a burden. And I don't get it. I really don't get it. I mean, I, because maybe it's the kind of person I am, I project this on other people. But that's one thing that I will say about myself, even before this situation, is that I never could look at someone with a handicap and make it worse. How could I, how could I go out of my way to make their life harder? And I see that so many times in our life. I also think with my children, because they're deaf blind, I mean, people don't even know deaf blind is around anymore. And um, I think it's just that they're not educated. They don't understand what deaf blindness is, what it looks like. Um, I think people will try to relate to me because they can't relate to the children. Early social awareness found in books and writing often failed at showing persons that are deaf or blind as human beings. More recent material has thankfully strived to bring more genuine stories to the forefront and help spread awareness about the range of personalities and environment one can find among the various communities. But deaf blindness is unique and its message has not spread to very many. What does society know about deaf blindness? The streets of Houston speak for themselves. We ask the public, what is deaf blindness? I don't really know any, anything about it. Very, very little. Not a whole lot, man, to be honest with you. Not too much, just pretty much what I see on TV. Not a whole lot. Not much. Um, I know I'm really happy that my son can see and hear. That's pretty much it. I know that there probably isn't as much awareness about it in the, in the public as there should be, and it's a, a larger issue than people think it is. It would be pretty hard not being able to see or hear. What would it be like to have three deaf-blind triplets? I think it'd be pretty hard. A lot of stress. I guess try to start finding out what kind of help is out there, what I could do. Wow. I really, I don't know. I would do a lot of research and try to get a lot of help. Possibly would have to resign from my job. You'd obviously look for as much support as you could. They were also asked if they could comprehend becoming deafblind. To be honest with you, I don't know how I would be able to react. I think as humans, we don't really have a choice but to find the strength to carry on. That's, that's human nature. So. I would have to, you know, call on, you know, the Lord above to, you know, give me whatever strength I need to handle this situation. And that would probably require a lot of money and a lot of... Considering having one sense taken away and having both taken away, I think it would be a, a very uh, tumultuous experience, man. They were also asked if they thought the United States government or education system was doing enough for persons with impairments and how it compared to other countries. I don't know. I know they do some, but I guess how much can you expect the government to do? You know, to be honest with you, I really, I really don't know, you know what they do and don't for folks with disabilities. I think the government tries to do the best they can, but I'm sure we can do more. The way I see it is more a family than a government that's helping. The government, in my opinion, the government could do a little bit more to help. I know that we have a lot of educational special resources for special needs kids. I just don't think it's enough. In Canada, the health care system is, is a lot better in that it's, it's paid for by the government. I grew up half my life in, in the Netherlands, and it's the same thing. I mean, they have universal health care. It would never be an issue, so to speak, for, for a couple, for one of the parents to have to stay home and take care of the kids. Like in this country, if one parent were to be out of work with three deafblind children, uh, it would be financially debilitating. 
Insurance is a constant battle. Uh, it's always a new list on what Medicaid may or may not pay for. We also have uh, secondary insurance that's a private insurance. Often things aren't covered for the triplets. Uh, cochlear implants, we have to go through two separate services to make sure things are getting paid for. We're constantly getting bills in the mail that we aren't responsible for that take time for us to sort out with the insurance companies or with the medical provider. The girls were really happy, you know, up to about two years old, and then they started getting frustrated, and they were on the floor in the fetal position, beating themselves and banging their head against the floor. And I thought, what happened to my happy baby? So I kept taking them to the doctor, thinking that something was wrong with their stomach, like they were in pain, that's where they were bending over. And they couldn't find anything wrong with them. So, I mean, the therapists that were working with them, everybody noticed this change. And then when I'd go to different appointments, they would throw up in the car every time we went somewhere. So I'd have to take all their car seats out, hose them down, put them in the wash, change their clothes. So um, that was difficult. But what I later learned is when, since they were losing their hearing slowly at a progress, you know, progressive sloping loss hearing, that um, it can make you nauseous and have some vertigo and make you uncomfortable. So not only were they frustrated by losing sound, they were also experiencing all these other problems, but by the time their hearing loss leveled out, that went away. The triplets do have um, several medical challenges. We've been very blessed that they're not sickly children. However, there are a lot of issues with cochlear implants, prosthetic eyes, and the the day-to-day -day problems that, that any healthy child can have. In any given week, we may see ophthalmologists, we may see audiologists, we may see their pediatrician. Uh, depending on the issue, the, the, uh, the cochlear implants have three different offices that we have to see in downtown Houston just to make sure that they're working properly. Part of the implant is inside their heads, so that's something that is always in the back of our minds that if anything were to go wrong there, um, it's difficult for us to assess what it could be without actually going down and having x-rays done, which, interestingly enough, because it's magnetic, our children cannot have MRIs. If they were to, um, if a technician or a nurse or a doctor were to accidentally give them an MRI, it could very well kill them. For George, Liz, and their children, simply getting from one day to the next can be a challenge. Uh, a typical day for me starts about five o'clock in the morning. Um, you know, it's just, it's just me and Liz, so, uh, some days I let her sleep, other days she lets me sleep, but for the most part we get up five o'clock, get, get in there and see what the kids have done. And we get them dressed and we try to help them dress themselves. So, well, for example, I'll start pulling down their, their diaper halfway and hope that they'll pull it down the rest of the way. And then it's the same thing, putting on the diaper, putting on the pants, help them find the inside of the shirt, help them put their arms through it, just trying to get them to the point where they'll be able to do that those things themselves in the morning. Starts with uh, socks, shoes, pants, shirts. Now this is times three, so um, then we get sports bras that they wear, these special little bras for their cochlear implants. Um, then I have to test all their cochlear implant equipment and put in this prosthetic eyes in. Get clips and ribbons and hair gel and toothbrushes and get all that stuff laid out. Um, then we fix their hair and we weave the cochlear implant into their hair so they can't Pull it off. Put it on, wake up. Wake up. There you go. Can you hear mama? Each kid has, because they're slightly different in size, I gotta figure out which clothes fit which kid. Uh, now I get the kids out. So I get the kids out of there, and usually if they've stayed up all night, they're like logs, so they're dead weight. So I get them out and start to dress them. Um, uh, the bus gets here at seven, take them to school. So I've got about an hour window to get all this done, so I'm hustling get them downstairs and one thing I do is try to help them walk down the stairs on their own instead of carry them and we get into the kitchen and I make three different breakfasts because they don't eat the same things at any meal. The bus picks them up at seven o'clock um, then it's just it's all deaf blind children's fund all day and I do that and Liz works to try to to bring in what income we can so we can keep this house afloat and, and you know keep everybody in food and clothes and that's what the day looks like. Uh, then the girls get home, uh, they arrive back here at four. We might take them outside to swing on the swing set or jump on the trampoline and then it's time for dinner and then after dinner we clean up the kitchen and we take them upstairs and put them in the bathtub and try to help them learn to wash their hair and to get out of the bathtub and find the towel and dry themselves and put their night clothes on and put them to bed. 
everything, we have to be hitting our marks. Uh, Liz and I both have to be on our A game all the time. I mean, because if we're not, I mean, this happens. We got piles and piles of laundry. Um, we have to stay on top of that. Take a moment and just imagine trying to explain the color red to a person born blind. Take a moment and imagine explaining pitch to a person born deaf. The problem in both cases is that there is no point of reference from which to begin. We can, at best, explain what a specific pitch or color means to us. Or how a particular observation makes us feel. Now imagine trying to get through complicated directions from someone who doesn't speak your language. First, you need to make them understand what you need. Then, you have to figure out their answer. Gestures might be enough, but without a formalized language, miscommunications are not so much possible as probable. Education involves two things, a common language and a common point of reference. Most children develop these things naturally through observation and mimicry in their younger years, but in order to teach a deaf-blind child, you must create both. The education of children who are deaf-blind in America has changed significantly over the past several decades. If you trace the history of, of the education of kids with deafblindness in our country, you really note that, that it began about 30 years ago. As a result of the rubella uh, population or, or the etiology of rubella, which is German measles, mothers attracted uh, rubella and were having babies who were deafblind. Because of that, the federal government recognized that um, there was a need to educate more teachers and that we didn't have enough professionals who understood exactly what were the, the techniques, the strategies, the things to use um, to help uh, development and learning for kids with deaf blindness. So they put money into into a federal program that established regional centers to influence the education of kids with deaf blindness. During that time, the kids with deaf blindness were usually congregated in separate settings, in institutions, in separate schools, etc. So the federal program would provide expertise to provide. Um, training or, or even at that point direct service and education to kids with deafblindness. Children identified as deafblind were primarily educated in segregated schools and institutions. However, today it is more likely that these children are learning along with their sighted and hearing peers in the neighborhood schools. Child development is incredibly important. With regard to the triplets, a, a typical child here at that age would be in kindergarten, first grade. Our academic level is higher than most, if not all, American schools based on the British curriculum. So we're a year advanced, more advanced than um, American schools anyway. So for that age, they would be in a kindergarten class learning a first grade curriculum. Many of our schools for the deaf and blind have integrated their deaf-blind students within the context of their general education programs. In addition, there has been an increase in the number of children identified as deafblind and in need of specialized educational support. Private schools in the British system, and especially Paddington, um, isn't governed um, by cuts. And in American schools where you have a cut, the first thing to go is music and the arts and drama. Whereas in British schools, it's a really fundamental and integral part of the curriculum. And that's what we tend to do here in Paddington as well. Even though these little ones are aged two through six, we expose them to the fine arts and we believe that it is a crucial part of their education um, because the preschool years is where your child's educational journey begins. Since the mid-1980s, the number of children who are deafblind needing services has nearly tripled increasing from roughly 4,000 to more than 10,000 today. I started researching online about the Texas School for the Blind, that they had a deafblind outreach, and that they were developing programs, and it was still pretty much in the infancy type thing. And he came, they came in and they said, no, you have to educate this child like he's deafblind. You can't educate them like he's blind or he's deaf. It's a whole different ball game. Despite the growing number of children and an increase in the complexity of their needs, federal funding for this group has remained unchanged. 
So we have seen virtually not only no money, but really every year a decrease in money because of the cost of living raises. So it's been very difficult for the deafblind professional community to maintain their research agendas, looking into new in interventions, etc. And at this point, virtually there's only a very, very little bit of money set aside for research and research in strategies. Deafblind children are no longer congregated and we have less number of professionals to address their needs. Rather than worrying about whether we should be using tactile sign language or visual sign language, whether finger spelling is the way forwards, whether the child needs a calendar system of symbolic objects, people love to focus on that and they think that's going to give them the, the way forward. But really that comes a long way after you've addressed the emotional needs of the child. And we're talking about a population of kids who can get very stressed very easily. In fact, much of their life and much of their day is, is high stress. These facts are not presented to diminish the efforts of the national community of parents, teachers, and deafblind specialists that work daily. This community is a close-knit group that is tied together through a federal funded program by the U.S. Department of Education. Each state has a deafblind project and each project is linked together by the efforts of the National Consortium on Deafblindness. However, the educational research of deafblindness remains shallow in comparison to other disabilities and seems to be related to the lack of funding and difficulty in gaining access to the population since they are so spread out. Deafblind children can't learn unless something has meaning to them. And I feel like education starts in the home, and that's why I want interveners in my home. And I want interveners who have been trained and gone to school and are degreed. I mean, I wouldn't go to a hospital and let somebody who hadn't gone to medical school treat me. Why should I let my child learn from somebody who hasn't been to school? Deaf blindness implies that there is a lack of flow of visual and auditory information that is flowing into that child at any given time. And so the intervener's role is related to that. First and foremost, they're there to help with the accessing of information. So deafblindness itself blocks access to information, to the visual and auditory flow of information, and the intervener's role is there to provide that access, to facilitate it, to get information to the child in a way that the child can understand. And then the second part of that role is to facilitate communication. So the intervener's there to work with the child to facilitate both to get communication in receptively, to help the child learn how to get communication out expressively, and to facilitate all interaction. And then the third area that the intervener works in has to do with social and emotional well-being. We know from research that deaf blindness itself is very isolating, that there's issues that occur neurologically when that information doesn't come in, that there's fear, that there's um, insecurity, that there's, um, it's, it's a very isolating disability. And so for any child or individual to grow and be healthy, they need to over, that isolation needs to be overcome. So that intervener's there to have a bond and a trust with the child, to help the child feel safe so that she, he or she can learn and to work on that self-determination piece that helps the individual to make choices and grow. You get very attached and um, very connected to the, the children or the students. I mean, you just, they just get into your heart and you just become, I mean, you, you try not to because they're not yours, they're not your child, but you just get so into trying to figure out what they're feeling and you want to figure out what they want and what they, you know, and um, you grow very close to the families and you work, you know, closely with the parents because the parents know their children better than anybody. Yeah. Six years old, I think, when we got an intervener for her. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, in an ideal world, in a, in a utopian world, she would have been born and there would have been an intervener and there would have been a whole team in place that would have just whisked us and told us exactly what deaf blindness was and would have then started communicating and building the blocks right up front and we would have had sign language and communication with Tanya when she was two. If you wanted to be an intervener in Texas, to my, to my knowledge, uh, you could actually start right away. You call the Texas School for the Blind and they would set you up with the appropriate agency 
and there are kids and young adults all over that are looking for interveners. The average wait right now is about three to four years. And had been to a, an intervener workshop and knew Christian needed an intervener. And so we worked toward getting him that and we lucked out. And so the last three years of his high school, he had an intervener and he went from um, not understanding any formal sign language to understanding and using some expressive sign language. It was like night and day. Interveners didn't exist seven or eight years ago. That model came out of Canada, actually. And it was like, well, this is great. You know, let's try this here. And now we have a fantastic program. It's still in its infancy, but it's really starting, starting to grow in this state. I was there in December training interveners in, in British Columbia. They are so much better trained. I was meeting interveners, chatting to them, and assuming they were teachers, like really highly credentialed, experienced teachers. And then they'd say, no, I'm just the one-on-one -on -one intervener for a 12-year-old or something. And I think, well, you're, you're, you're more skilled than most of the teachers I'm working with in California, because they don't have a deaf-blind training. You know, these are like severe handicap teachers or general special ed teachers. It's really impressive what they're doing up there. They don't have to have a degree in the state of Texas. You have, it helps, but there is not really a degree program. There is training provided by the Texas School for the Blind where you actually can get hands-on working and be paired with a mentor who can answer questions that other people can't. It's come a long way, but it has a lot further to go. You know, it hasn't been that long since sign language interpreters had to be certified in the school district. It hasn't been very long. and. Um, I would like to see it where interveners have some kind of certification and the school district recognize the job, the name, the job description, what you need and what these students need to um, be successful and to learn. If interveners are not used appropriately, they can produce harmful effects on kids with, uh, with deaf blindness. There's just so many misunderstood areas in deaf blindness and then all the children vary so much and there aren't any norms so I think it is hard to develop programs that will fit all the children but I think that we can develop programs that help each child individually and I think it sucks to be like oh Helen Keller was special when her own teacher said that she was just average intelligence and she had this whole opportunity to learn 24 hours a day I think we should do the best we can to get that for different children like most conditions deaf blindness has been with us throughout history. And like most conditions, it took one particularly noteworthy case to bring it to public attention. Helen Keller is a, is a good model for a lot of people. Uh, she's an inspiration. She is an individual. She was an individual that had a certain kind of specialized support in her own time. And we recognize that. If you remember back with Helen Keller, the teacher was with her all day. I mean communication, mobility, all of that happens within context of the whole day. So we need to have that covered. And I started to read about Helen Keller and I was absolutely fascinated. And I fell in love with Helen Keller. My mother and father bought me a book about her. I read all about her. In the back of the book was the American Sign Language as well as Braille. And I was just fascinated by all of it. And one day on June 1st, 1968, um, my parents came to me and uh, broke the news to me that Helen Keller had passed away. And I will never forget it. I remember being in our kitchen in our home on Long Island, New York, and being in my mother's lap and crying my eyes out. And I was just inconsolable at the death of Helen Keller. And I can't tell you how many times a year I'm called by elementary schools uh, to come in and speak about Helen Keller, to speak about her experiences, to speak, to bring in Braille to show students of how she communicated and how she read. Um, and, and, and I take pause in that sometimes and say, gee, there are so many deafblind people, successful deafblind people in the world today. They really should be coming in here and not speaking of Helen Keller, but showing living examples of how 
People of difference, deafblind people, can live uh, a, a typical life with the use of assistive technology, with the use of um, some support system. We have people that have gone beyond Helen Keller these days. And with the technology we have today, it's, it's certainly possible. Who knows what Helen Keller would have done with the technology that we have today. Can deafblind individuals find work after education? Located on the North Shore of Long Island, stands the Helen Keller National Center for Deafblind Adults. The mission of the Helen Keller National Center for the Deafblind Youths and Adults is to enable each person who is deafblind to live and work in his or her community of choice. Our history goes back to the days of the Industrial Home for the Blind. And back in the 1920s, um, two deafblind men went down to the IHB in Brooklyn and they tried to get a job in the shops. And in those days, blind people worked in shops where they made mops and brooms and things like that. That was the vocational goal for anyone who was blind. And there was a gentleman who managed the shops down there by the name of Peter Salmon. He was the business manager who had been a schoolmate of Helen Keller's up at Perkins, and he had learned the manual alphabet. So he taught the manual alphabet to the foreman at the shop. He was then able to hire the two brothers who started, and out of that effort, by the 1940s, they had developed a deafblind unit in Brooklyn that was composed of about 12 to 15 deafblind men who all worked in the shops. The government then started looking at this, and they said, geez, you know, is there a potential for people who are deafblind to do other things if they were given the proper training? So they gave the IHB a five-year pilot grant back in the 1960s to see if deafblind people were capable of doing other jobs. And out of that came the Helen Keller National Center. We opened up here in 1969. What gives people the ability to get a job is, of course, there's their qualifications, their attitude, but very critical also is their social skills. And a lot of time when people are considering job placement, whether it's a person with a disability or deafblind or whatever, you have to look at that particular person's skills. And you can realize that people can succeed within those systems. Because I, from my experience, you know, the skills are really going to help me with my life, to the training, especially for work and things like that. So it's really great. My self-esteem has really improved while I'm here. The quality of my life has improved. My attitude has gone from negative to positive while I've been here because of the encouragement. So when I came here, I didn't want to leave. So I decided that if it was at all possible, I would come back and get the training that I needed because I couldn't do what I did before. I wasn't talented in computers anything but nursing and at that time nursing didn't worry about computers we worried about people my goal was to be a computer programmer but during the, my freshman year I noticed some problems with my vision my vision began to deteriorate quickly and I had to trouble handling that pressure I feel that I'm behind the times with a lot of the new technology we have here, especially for Braille devices, and I'm really um, excited about learning those things. I enjoy emailing my friends. That's important for me, too, and that's another reason I need to learn Braille. I'm the technology developer, and, and I do training and development. That's my profession here. I'm responsible for training students to use different equipment to be able to access different equipment. Okay, I want to show you Windows with the Braille display right here. And on the computer, I want to show you how I can connect the display, this Braille display to Windows Eyes, which is a program that's on the computer. Hey, you close. Outlook Express Method. Yes, why? Button. Would you like to make it your default mail client? No M. Outlook. Edit box. Password P. Dialog. Please. Standard box. Dialog. Configuring Outlook. Migrating account settings. Mike. When I'm traveling out in the community, it connects with the satellite. 
and it will send all the information in Braille to my Braille note. It lets me know where I'm standing, and it tells me the exact position where cross streets are. It also lets me know what's around, like restaurants and other businesses that are around. So I can identify specific restaurants, stores, other locations, and go there. And I said, Helen Keller National Center, that deals with deaf-blind people, and I called them up, and I made an appointment, and came up here and fell in love. You know, the, you, you're going to meet a lot of people in your lifetime, but it's going to be rare that you're going to meet a group like this. One of the biggest problems we have in developing services is that it's an expensive population to serve. And that's the reality of the situation. Like so many other families, the Hooker family had given everything they had to give and still needed more. I can generate a lot of stress just worrying about uh, our family's day-to-day -day existence, trying to figure out uh, everything from uh, where Sophie's misplaced her shoes uh, to the bigger issues of how we're going to pay for their education. And it's, a, it's, it's an everyday repeating battle. Helen Keller said once um, that before she learned language, she always felt like this big piano was going to fall on her, like that tense of anxiety, not knowing what was going to happen next. I really hope the girls don't feel that way. I don't know where we go from here because, you know, I spent the last week pretty much making Liz miserable while I complained about everything and how my life has gone and, and not even considering anything about her and her feelings, just, you know, why me, 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 you know, she's, she's had to deal with this for you know, six years and I've been dealing with it for two and I'm like a little crybaby. I told her I'm gonna leave, you know, I just keep, I just keep threatening to leave and like that's gonna change anything, you know, just like, I just wanna get away, like I don't, I don't wanna have to deal with all the stuff that comes with this. I'm dealing with all the financial stuff, all the emotional stress, all the, everything, it's just, I just, I don't know why life can't just be simple. Why can't go back to, to just being just easy and the stress. It's these uh, our girls, our triplets, Sarah, everything. It's gonna it's gonna be like this, and it's probably always gonna be like this. I and mean, we can make it better, but I don't know. I was upstairs looking at Zoe and all of a sudden I had this whole sinking sensation. I felt like the world was moving past me really fast and um, George was looking at me and he's like, what's wrong? And I said, I haven't dealt with any of this stuff. I've just been moving distraction to distraction and I need to get out of here. And he said, well, where do you want to go? And I'm like, I don't know, I just need to drive. And he handed me the keys and the credit card and I put some clothes in a pillowcase and I left. I thought, I'll just drive out. I-10, I don't know, to see what I see, and it's so funny, like, the thing, people think about going on vacation and um, seeing things and having experiences, but for me, like, the most enjoyable part of all of it was if I had to pee, I peed. If I wanted to read something, I read something. If I wanted to smoke a cigarette, I smoked a cigarette. Freedom. There was no, oh, let me, I got to make sure this one's eaten and this one's taken their cochlear implant off and this is broken and I've got to look for this part and someone's knocked their eyeball out and I've got to find that. I mean, it was just... Whatever I needed, I could take care of when I wanted. And um, it was also the first time that I've been alone with myself. Everything's, you know, I think we're, we've been really honest with each other and we know where our problems are coming from. And I think we've both owned up to a lot of things. And um, we're gonna be moving forward and I, I think we're gonna work all this out. We just need to take more time for each other and ourselves somehow. The family wasn't used to exposure. They had protected themselves from the public eye, but all that was about to change. Dr. Phil wanted to enable the family to work out their issues and begin the journey of repairing and strengthening their relationship. What was about to happen would change everything for the family.
George and Liz say taking care of their triplets is a thankless 24-hour-a-day job. They just say it's never-ending. We're at our friends, the Nelsons' home, watching the Dr. Phil show. It's our big debut. And so far, so good. I just worry. I just want them to feel what I feel for them and just know that I'm going to take the best care of them that I can. I don't, I don't dwell on stuff that happened because I don't have time. I don't have time to sit there and have a pity party. I, I have things to do. I have children that need me. I can't do this. I can't. The, the 10 million people in America watching this show right now are humbled in your presence. Mackenzie LaVar graduated as intervener for deafblind persons from the prestigious George Brown College in Canada and is top notch in her field. So where are you, Mackenzie? How are you doing? Good. Yeah. Oh, Give us a few words Look at about you. what intervener. Who is that? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> she has, I don't want to be here. But. She has makeup on. <laughs> I just felt that the triplets needed more time with an intervener, so we made a few phone calls. He was nice. From someone that does. Like One of the people that partners with the Dr. Phil Foundation on really important things is LowerMyBills.com. They were inspired by this story and have agreed to join us and donate $50,000 to cover the expense of McKenzie working with the triplets for an additional year. Uh, Matt Coffin. <laughs> Okay. Oh, okay. Perkins School for the Blind, where Helen Keller actually studied, has offered to provide a very important one-week evaluation, which will include psychological and physical exams, to help find out each specific need of the triplets and work with the intervener, McKenzie, to start preparing them for success. And you guys know who they are. And so we've made that arrangement for them to do that as well, so we can get... <laughs> uh, we're going to send the two of you guys on a seven-day round trip um, to Hawaii. We're, you doing okay? I'm glad it wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. It really was what we lived. The show was what we experienced. After the Dr. Phil show, having Mackenzie here as our first intervener has already made a huge difference in our lives. It gives Liz and I time to do things with Sarah that we didn't think we'd be able to do this soon. Um, we've seen a huge difference in Zoe um, just from the time that she met Mackenzie until now. She's made great strides because it's, it's truly one-on-one. -on -one. Mackenzie's able to live life with her. She's presenting things to Zoe on Zoe's level. We're the ones that provide anticipation, motivation, communication, and confirmation. Um, we're also the bridge between them and their environment. With these girls, I will be doing one-on-one, -on -one, so one child at a time. I come 8 o'clock in the morning, and I would start from the very beginning. So this child coming out of their, their bedroom, going, taking a bath, uh, doing some toilet training, uh, brushing their teeth, trying to give them some life skills, things that they can do independently. So getting dressed, teaching them how to put their own clothes on, putting their shoes on, uh, having, uh, being organized, like it's always the underwear first and then the shirt and then the shoes, you know, always being in the same sequence. So they will always remember what they need to do next. Um, and then there's making food. Where does food come from? Most likely they do not know that. So going to the store, what do you want to buy today? Uh, let's buy some milk and bringing it back and maybe making pudding with the milk. So they realize that pudding is made with milk. Um, making their lunch together. I'm also uh, working on doing the alphabet with them. So I'd be doing a book with sand, so it's tactile, so they can feel it. So doing the motions of an A and also having the braille beside it. So when they want to read, eventually they'll get to the point where they can read Braille. With Zoe, just getting her to do things, she, she will hit herself uh, when she's very, very frustrated. And that's her way of saying, 
I'm, I'm done, I don't want to do this, leave me alone. Uh, for, for an intervener, that would be our chance to say, how do you sign frustrated or mad? And giving them that, instead of hitting themselves, learning how to say, I don't want to do this, stop. It's been really exciting to see our dream country for Zoe, because um, we knew what she needed, but just this last week has been confirmation that we're making the right choice for her. Um, she's already learned a new sign. You're thirsty, want a drink? Yeah, you're thirsty. What do you want? Jump, jump, more. She's already learned some life skills, like how to get her snacks out and how to get her juice out in our home. Um, she's already like walking to the front door and opening it and wanting to go outside. She's just starting to have a will of her own and she's actually able to do things for herself. And I'm just astounded. I mean, Mackenzie has great instincts. She knows um, which things to concentrate on with Zoe. She won't let Zoe get away with anything. So, and, and I'm learning so much watching Mackenzie. I'm learning how to interact with my child just by watching um, Mackenzie work with Zoe. It's just, it's awesome. I think before the Dr. Phil show, I thought it was gonna be a solution that people were gonna get it from this one show. But now I realize it's just the beginning of raising awareness for deaf blindness. Um, first, we just had to get out there, and I think that's what it did. Um, people know about us, they know about our kids, and eight million people heard the word deafblind and heard the word intervener, and that's the beginning. But there will always be those for whom there is no easy fix, those who will have to learn to live in a dark and silent world. For those, hope comes not in the shape of a pill or in the form of a new surgery, but through the love, kindness, and understanding of those willing to help. Yeah, you take a trip to Rome, you can do all this planning, you know exactly what sites you're going to go see, where, who's picking you up from the airport and whatnot. And then all of a sudden the plane lands and you get off the plane and you're in Holland. And that's not where you had intended to go, right? You were, had all these great plans for, you know, in this case, the kid or whatever. But now you get off this plane and you're in Holland. And it's not that Holland's bad or compared to Rome, it's just different, right? And you adapt to it. You figure out the, the, you know, the new sites you're going to go see. They're not going to be the same. You're not going to go see the Colosseum, but you're going to see something else, right? It may be the windmills of Holland, maybe something. It's a different adventure that you're now on, um, but it, it, it's still an adventure, right? And that's kind of the, you know, the best way I can say, um, best analogy that I can come up with to show you, you know, what it's like being having a special needs kid. It's different than than being normal. It's okay. It's scary but you'll overcome it and you'll get through it. Families are really the ones that figure this out. They're the ones who know how to do it. They know their children the best. We have to listen to them. We have to support them and help them. You know, people, you know, are getting it, that this is, that these kids are very bright children and that their parents are right, that they can learn and they want to learn. Because every parent I, I know has said that and they're exactly right. Most parents worry about their children's health, number one. And if you, most kids that are deafblind are probably in somewhat medically fragile, too. And so you spend the first few years of their life trying to keep them alive, and then you worry about the other stuff later. And when it comes to deafblindness, you just do the best you can. Christian died in 2005 and I'm not going to stop because I know this is the right thing to do. You know, I will continue to, to fight for the right of the deafblind until it's my last breath, and that is getting interveners for all that need them. And it, it's gonna be a tough fight, but deafblind awareness, what they need, um, I'll continue to work toward that. From the struggles of a mother trying to support her children alone to a family moving forward together, the story of the Hooker family is a story of endurance, hope, and of faith. The way I see our life, my family in the future, um, I have huge dreams for my children. I want to see Emma. I, I want to see Emma and Zoe walk across the stage in high school and get their diploma, and do it by themselves. I dream of the day that Zoe can touch Liz's face and know that that's her mother. 
that she can communicate a love for Liz that Liz can feel. And Liz can know that everything that we went through was worth it. Just, you know, I didn't know this till, till they became my children, that I could love this much, that I could want to give them everything. And the fact that they have so much to, to overcome in their life, that's so much more that I feel like I need to give them. Years from now, I see our family interacting like a normal family. You know, just, we may be signing to each other or we may be speaking through cochlear implants, but we're gonna be a normal, loving family. And I'm going to get to ask the girls all these questions that I've been dying to know about them. And I'm gonna get to find out, you know, what they've thought about all these years or what they remember or how they felt. It's just, I can't wait. I can't wait to get to know my kids. I mean, I can't wait to get to know what's going on inside their head, you know, what they're thinking of. Because you can tell they're thinking of stuff or what makes them laugh. You know, if they're just sitting by themselves and messing with a toy or something and they just giggle uncontrollably, I want to know why. I want to know what they were thinking of. I want to know what dreams they're going to have. Um, We've been down so many roads that were dead ends that we realized we just have to make a new path. If we don't blaze a new trail and try something different, we're going to be stuck in the same circular logic that's been going on for the last 20 years. And that's what we want to do with the Deaf Blind Children's Fund. It, it's, it's our symbol of hope, but it's more than that. It's, uh, it's a radical change. We want to do what worked for Helen Keller. We want to do what's worked for so many people in other countries, uh, Canada and Europe and South America. There's, there's places all over the world where they use the intervener model, where deafblind children are doing so much better than the kids in our own country. And we're the last superpower that's left. We're the wealthiest country in the world, and it's a crime that our kids don't get the advocacy and the education that they deserve. And that's what we want to do. The Deafblind Children's Fund, before they put me in the ground, I want to know that we fulfilled our mission, that every deafblind child in the United States and even the world can have an intervener if they need one and if they want one. Deafblind people, it's not the end of the world. We can live equally to others. children and I just can't imagine how they can do this. It just, uh, my God. Oh, boy. Mm. I went to film school, gave it everything I had, uh, learned everything I could learn, uh, and then this comes along and throws every bit of that into a whole new light, which is you know, maybe that's not what you're supposed to do. You know, so maybe. There's, there's four kids involved. So when we got married, I got an instant family. Right. Okay. Oh, oh, and and so they got lighting. I don't. You know these guys? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. What's up, guys? Michael? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> David. How are you? George Hooker, right? Yeah. We know who you are. <laughs> We, we don't want to deal with that issue. Okay. Because if you do, I'm stepping out of the room. I'll watch it later. But no, we're, we're really brothers. Right? I've already done my part. He hasn't done his yet. Um, 
Do you, yeah. go, you guys are both voicing this thing? Yeah. <laughs> what, what's going to happen? <laughs> <laughs> We've been hiding in there waiting for you to get here. Yeah. <laughs>